In the centre of London, only 100 yards from Harrods, nearly 250 horses spend their lives serving the Queen. Britain's most senior regiment, the Household Cavalry, has guarded the monarch for over 350 years. This series goes behind the scenes of great state events. Riding with the cavalry for the first time, getting a trooper's eye view. Driving with the iron horses and the men who work and fight with them. The regiment would be nothing without its horses, the Cavalry Blacks. Thank you. We follow the journey of 12 young new recruits who are expected to go from this... ...to this in only 16 weeks. And discover the living history behind this remarkable regiment. The household cavalry consists of two contrasting halves, the fighting side and the ceremonial side. This morning, the combined mounted regiment, the lifeguards and the blues and royals, practice ceremonial duty in Hyde Park. Major Mark Goodwin Hudson is commanding the blues and royals. I feel very strongly that when we actually go out on parade, we are not only representing ourselves and the British Army, but this is brand Great Britain. It's a very bold, confident, strong statement about who this nation is and our success on the battlefield. We are there to honour the Queen and we do everything we can to ensure that what we're doing is excellent. The regiment constantly requires new recruits of both horses and men. Yet 95% of the household cavalry have never been near a horse before they join the regiment. Twelve new recruits are about to start a 16-week crash course in riding. If they pass, they will qualify to take part in all ceremonial duties. Trooper Glenn Forrest has no idea that he has just embarked on one of the hardest courses in the British Army. I didn't have anything going for me at school, because at school I was just a tear away. At school didn't suit me one bit. I can't sit still for two minutes in the classroom learning. So I thought, oh, I'm the only way I'm really going to get anywhere and get a career out or anything in this world, so, so that's why I joined up. He likes you, Forrest. You know what that means when it sees a pack? Oh. He's not happy. <laughs> Trooper Bobby Baker is only 17. He spent his whole life in North London. I basically joined the army after I left secondary school, so I haven't really done much. It seemed like something to do, get away from like your mum and everything, start like being a man, basically. 20-year-old Quarry is three years older than young Baker. I've never ridden a horse before, so I'll probably be flying off later. And it's not long before he's showing Bobby who's boss. I think the horse likes me. What do you like him? I don't know if he's trying to bite me. Give it a kiss. <laughs> be more confident with it when you go in. Put your hand on his bum, give it a pat, and then work your way up. Don't just steam straight in. If I get to know you, either that or elite you, one of the two, innit? Not really nice <laughs> I think he'll probably eat me. He'll be fine, mate. He'll be good. Salisbury Plain. In contrast to their fellow soldiers on ceremonial duty, the cavalrymen train for war. They exercise their iron horses, the scimitar light tank armed with a 30mm cannon and capable of over 50 miles per hour. On active service, the household cavalry are reconnaissance troops and experts in hide and seek. Corporal of Horse Richard Bentley is a senior vehicle commander. We operate forward of our own troops. Um, it could be anywhere up to about 50 kilometres, like an early warning system. Of course, if we know what they're doing, they don't know what we're doing, we've got an advantage. That's why the vehicles are small, um, very fast and mobile, so the boys can get in, do the job and get back out. Bentley has served in Bosnia and Belize and has spent three years on a horse. Here, his squadron trained for the real thing. They have to be ready to deploy to any war zone in the world with just three days' notice. 
In this practice battle scenario, they'll play the bad guys, a ragtag militia who've taken over the once sleepy Wiltshire village of Imba. Their job is to defend the village to the last man. On the other side, Apache Longbow helicopters are used to support the parachute regiment as they attack the village. There are two Apache helicopters to the southeast. One of the OPs just picked it up, about 2k away, coming this way. Bentley's troop is about to experience the harsh reality of battle, but in a simulated war zone. They're taking the OP screen out and then they're going to move on to us. It's vital they learn the essential skills needed to survive the real thing. The battle for Imber has begun. At the cavalry's barracks in Windsor, 12 trainee troopers are about to begin riding school. They will live and breathe horses here together for the next three months. But Bobby Baker doesn't know one end of a saddle from another. OK, so reassess the saddle situation. Is that the right way round? The next mountain they have to climb is getting on their horse. OK, it's a horse, not a climbing frame. I don't want to see legs hanging off saddles, arms hanging around horses' necks, anything like that. Lock your arms out first and quietly right leg over, lower yourself down quietly. Quickest and best is the term used to describe vaulting straight onto nearly six foot of horse. Some find it harder than others. Too many pies, Gardner and Thompson. Out up there! Come on, man, lay all day. Two, three, up, oh, go on, lock, lock, lock. But it's trooper Glenn Forrest who has the greatest trouble leaving the ground. Getting on, it's a bit, well, difficult than we expected it's because it's more technique than his strength. Look up, lock your arms in. Go on, really lock that wrist. If they'd done it, I thought, well, you just scrabble onto horse. The way they do it, it's still all set to drills and timings. God straight, God straight. Old Hand Quarry is bored waiting for Forrest and decides to take Bobby Baker for a walk. Ah, you see? Look at that. Finally, Forrest climbs his mountain. Once everyone's on top, it's time to take the ride for their very first equine steps. OK, then, so here we go. God help us. Walk mark. To add to the learning curve, they ride without stirrups. Hands forward, close your leg on, allow it to move forward. Now they're just getting used to uh, the position and the feel of the horse. So you can see when they first started, they were really quite tense, and especially the guy on the back there. But now he's actually relaxing and feeling. You can see his body moving, so he's able to relax his muscles and, and get into it. I was exactly the same. I'd never ridden before, and I, I know exactly what they're going through. Yeah, change of underpants at the end, perhaps. And again, and again. Well, sit. sit back, sit back, pull on both rays and walk. Corporal Major Des Payne takes Glenn Forrest aside for some remedial training. It's all technique and I just can't do it. It's just like a bit of an idiot. It's, it's coming. So, keep your chin up, you're doing well. Yes, sir. Night falls in Imber a besieged village fortified by a company of defenders and the household cavalry. Tonight, they expect to be attacked by hundreds of troops. They'll practice the vicious art of street fighting, a vital skill needed to survive modern war zones. Inside a bombed out house, Bentley briefs his crews. We'll move our two vehicles into the wooded area. All right, so we're out of sight, so they don't know where we are. We'll set them on the net, and as and when he wants us, We'll bomb burst around the village, all right, giving the um, three power boys to the enemy as much stick and, and harassment as we can give them. And that's us, all right, waiting for the war to happen and for us to get involved in the war. Bentley's crews man their tanks and prepare for battle. Being the op for the, you know, the enemy, we're slightly outnumbered, probably about five to one. Um, and they've got to attack our helicopters as well. Um, I think we're here to die, to be quite honest. <laughs> But um, Colonel's plan is obviously we've got, we've got quite a few plans ourselves to make it very, very difficult for them. And several of the build buildings are very, very heavily defended. It's two o'clock in the morning, 
and there's a week to go before the big event in the cavalry calendar, when the Queen will ceremonially preside over the official state opening of Parliament. The police have closed the streets of central London. The mounted regiment have special permission to rehearse the Queen's escort whilst London slumbers. Captain Dickie Waygood is the riding master and responsible for the choreography of the event. We're just riding now down to Buckingham Palace where we will uh, do a full rehearsal, riding from Buckingham Palace down to Parliament Square and then wait for about 40 minutes and then back again. The regiment leaves barracks at 3.15 a.m. precisely. We've got to get our timing absolutely right. We have today to get it right and then on the day itself, so th there's not a lot of room for error. Whilst the Queen sleeps, the regiment arrives at Buckingham Palace to rehearse their escort. Dickie rides into the inner quadrangle, ready to cue the moves. As Her Majesty uh, comes down the stairs to climb into the coach, step into the coach, then I give my first salute, which is the signal to start the whole proceedings. Last state visit, so I was talking to the commanding officer, so I saluted him and said, good morning, Colonel. And as I saluted him, I realised I, I was just about to set the whole, uh, whole uh, proceedings off, and luckily I uh, managed to stop it before it started. <laughs> At 3.42 precisely, the Queen's carriage, minus the Sovereign... I'm saluting. ...leaves for the House of Lords. This is our bread and butter work. We're here as Sovereign's bodyguards, and not only do we have a, uh, a ceremonial role, but we also have a security role as well. The Household Cavalry then escort an empty Queen's carriage down the Mall. Come on, distances, keep it there and get covered off for a Dickie's job is to ride amongst the divisions and keep the 130 men and horses on their toes. Carry your swords. Come on, ride straight. Get two yards knee to knee, the leading section. Without split second accuracy, speed, and timing, there will be an almighty horse jam. Just keep it quiet on the format, gents, and don't rush it. Quarter past four, I believe. The divisions arrive at the House of Lords at exactly 4.18 a.m. Dickie takes the opportunity to make sure every man and horse is in their precise position. Glance down out the corner of your eye while you're dressing off, gents. That's where you look where your horse's feet are. That's where you want to be on the day, OK? The lifeguards carried out their first royal escort nearly 350 years ago, when King Charles II returned from exile. Ever since, historically, their first role has been to act as guards, sentries and escorts to the sovereign. Dawn starts to break as the cavalry escort the carriage back to Buckingham Palace. The commander of the household cavalry, Colonel Hammond Massey, rides on the back of the state coach. The point of the household cavalry is not just a, um, as an escort to Her Majesty, but to complement uh, the dignity uh, of the occasion and of the Queen's Majesty. I think this is something that these days people forget. I mean, it's rather like professional actors producing a play in a theatre. The general public that come to watch the play have no idea of the amount of work and rehearsal, makeup, wardrobe, everything else that goes into it in order to make the production. The regiment returns the empty Queen's carriage to Buckingham Palace, where they practice the rank past or regimental salute to the Queen. As she's still in bed, it's the commander who takes the honour on her behalf. You must keep going, gentlemen, you must keep going. By 5.30, the whole practice is over. Ah, it's great. Yeah, I mean, it's still... I think when, it, when you stop getting that little tingle down the back of your neck, 
then that would be time to pack up, but I've still, that's still happening for me, so, no, it's fabulous. Dawn also rises over the village of Imber, where the fighting half of the household cavalry have been awaiting a night attack. With one ear to the radio, the men have slept in their battle positions. Suddenly, Bentley's team receive orders to take up positions against Apache helicopter gunships that are probing the village defences. They hover up to three miles away, targeting their prey. With his machine gun loaded merely with blanks, Bentley takes on the helicopters. Contact Apache, wait out. Apache's destroyed, one over New Zealand farm, and the other over crossing site and two. The defenders open fire on the first wave of attacking paratroops. This is simulated warfare, using blank ammunition and umpires to decide casualties. It's a central practice for the real thing. The attacking paratroops are judged to be losing the battle. From our point of view, it seems to be going very well. Um, just caught in the net, it seems they have been run out of steam. Soon the village is littered with pretend dead and wounded. But the paras press on with their attack. It's time for the militia's commander to send in Bentley's scimitar tanks. The enemy forces are literally about, what, 200 metres from the front now around the Bentley. Yeah, back on. In true cavalry tradition, Bentley charges into the melee. But this action causes the attacking paratroops to call in an airstrike. Request Apache to take out the scimitar, otherwise main and all echeloning troops will be cut to bits. Yeah, I'll say again, request Apache to take out the scimitar on the south side of building 13, over. Point zero, I've got the other one on this. Right, DS, that strike's now coming in! The Apache is loaded with Hellfire anti-tank missiles. Its longbow radar can track 256 targets at the same time. Bentley becomes the first. His battle is suddenly over. The umpires have decided he's dead. His tanks have been wiped out by overwhelming air power. With the armor neutralized, the paras make steady progress through the village. There's uh, about three or four buildings left, I think. Um, they're getting close to the HQ as well, uh, which is probably the, the, one of their main targets. You're right in there. <laughs> Doing something like this, you know, they could keep you alive um, if it come for real. It's like anything, the more you practice it, the slicker you get, you train hard and you fight easy. Bentley and the armoured regiment are always in a constant state of readiness for war. But before joining the tanks, most troopers must spend a couple of years riding horses on ceremonial duty. It's the fifth day for the new arrivals, and the five o'clock starts are starting to sting. Getting up at, like, sparrow five o'clock every morning. That's a brand new one. Just have to work with it, basically. The pressure's being piled on by Lance Corporal of Horse, Mark Javorski. Hey, what are you doing? Listen to me. Hey, look at me. Sweep the stalls out. This is the way it works. Trust me, man, that's why I'm in a job. You sweep the stalls out first. Complete, everyone. And someone says, everyone's stalls done. Yeah. Nice one. Get up the end, sweep down in the water, job done breakfast. All right, you're making work for yourselves. You've got to start working as a team. Do you understand? Let's get it done. Let's get a scoff. Come on, I'll make Marvin. In only four months, these total novices will be expected to take part in a major parade almost every week. It's one of the hardest courses in the British Army to do the riding school. It's so intense. 
a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of late nights, a lot of early mornings, a lot of stress, pressure from inspections and got to pass this and pass this and pass this to stay with everyone. Peer pressure is huge. They have to grow up quick or they, uh, they get left behind. It's as simple as that. But at least the boys are beginning to bond with their horses. Trooper Kiwi Hookham is playing footsie with Vagabond. Trooper Daniel Evans has developed a particularly close bond with Seymour. Yeah, you do. Right, kiss, kiss. Thank you. Smile. Yeah, good boy. <laughs> Today, the ride will trot for the first time. Straight on top. Take up your reins. Trooper Forrest's quickest and best has sunk to slowest and worst. There's still a bit to be desired, still need a hand up and everything, but it's getting there. I should get it before end of course anyway. No, take it out on the horse, not the horse's fault, it's you, you can't get up. Lance Corporal of Horse Lee Golder decides to take it out on the rest of the ride, making them mount and dismount continuously until Forrest can get on his horse. I'm a crusty old man and I've got the flu, do you know what I mean? I can still get up there. All right, I'll show you once and it's your go. Happy? Hand on the front, hand on the back, good grip, bounce once. Get yourself, when you're on there, you can stay all day. Right, you know what I mean? Best Just get your belly onto there, all right? All right, chest on, get up there, push up. There you go. Come on, swing, 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 swing. You've got braces. OK, next stage in your training. This is where we get bodies everywhere. Right, halt! Your first trot. So ride, walk, march. Ride, prepare to trot. So Come on, get your legs into it. Get it forwards. Get it up there. Come on, keep working the legs. It's not long before the ride takes its first casualty. Ride, halt. This course is going to be no easy ride. At first I thought, yeah, anyone can ride a horse, it's easy peasy. No. Well, you've got your paras and your commandos. They should come and have a go at this, because I bet half of them couldn't do it, because it's real tough going. It's the hardest thing I've done, <laughs> without a doubt. <laughs> well done for this morning. Not an easy thing to pick up, the trot. However, we cope with it. A few accidents, and we're going to have more of them when we start the canter and when we start the jumping. OK, but so far, well done. It's the day of the state opening of Parliament, the first big event in a season that sees 10 major parades over the next three months. The bustle in the lines of temporary stables hides the pre-match nerves. Over in the officers' mess, second-in-command Captain Rob Gibbs is getting dressed. Always takes a while getting into this, this clothing. I like to give myself plenty of time and just chill. The Blues and Royals plumes for the officers are always somewhat bigger by uh, tradition, I believe. The Connie also had a word with me the last time for mine being slightly too big, so it's been, uh, as it were, hung just to make it uh, slightly more controlled. I believe the soldiers use... Uh, hair products on theirs. Yeah, I think that's OK. Just place that one out. The tunic with uh, my stars, captain's rank on here. They're sort of quilted, extra thick. And you tend to sweat a lot in these with the carasses on as well. They tend to act like a bit like a pressure cooker as well. And you always find these gold bits here eat into your neck. So you always get it almost looks like love bites down your neck. So it doesn't, uh, doesn't look too good. But, um, it, yeah, it's um, a hot number to wear. Officers have the luxury of an orderly to help them dress. Yeah. Cool. The rest of the regiment mount up. 130 men and their horses are inspected by the commanding officer at Knightsbridge, Lieutenant Colonel Valentine Wojka. You used to check tapes, uh, left epaulet, you see what I mean? He's a stickler for detail. Morning, Colonel Greek. Thank you. It takes an hour for the inspection party to pass through the ranks. 
it's a big parade and you know we're on the show and unfortunately however much practice we put in however much training however much kit cleaning we're only judged on those sort of 18 minutes that we're trotting up and down the mile from uh, from Buckingham Palace down to Parliament Square. So if something goes wrong in those 18 minutes, then that that really yeah sort of mars us, and you know the, all the homework that we put in then will, almost feels wasted. Major Mark Goodwin Hudson is the field officer. He'll lead the regiment and personally escort the Queen's carriage. I want to look as um as smart as possible in order to set the tone, really. And ride on good lines and ride straight and right. ride confidently. So that um, I'm setting an example for the rest of the regiment as they follow on. I feel the sort of person who's going to ride down the mall in full state kit. You're not the sort of person who's going to have made any compromises. Every single part of your kit must be checked. Every single aspect of your horse's kit must be in the right place and in the right condition. The regiment is tuned up and ready to go. At 10.18 on the dot, the entourage leaves barracks and sets off for Buckingham Palace. 130 horses and men have got through two litres of hoof oil, five cases of brass polish and 260 tins of boot polish. It's taken at least a thousand man hours to get this show on the road. Throughout history, monarchs and governments have come and gone, but one scene that has remained the same for nearly 350 years is the household cavalry, escorting the monarch to and from parliament in this key event in the cavalry's calendar. The eyes of the world are upon them as the Queen arrives at Parliament. My Lords and members of the House of Commons, my government will continue to pursue economic policies which entrench stability and promote long-term growth and prosperity. Like all bodyguarding duty, there's a lot of hanging around. After an hour, the Queen concludes her business and the escort is back on the road. After four hours in the saddle, the household cavalry returns to barracks. Mark Goodwin Hudson's family are waiting for him. It went very smoothly. We had the spacings. We were going at the right pace. It was good. It was very good. I was pleased. Um, and I also managed to get a coffee at the House of Lords, which was good. Um, very good. Yeah, it was great. Next time on the Queen's Cavalry, the best turned out trooper is presented to the Queen. But Warlord has other ideas. There's cantering chaos in the riding school and firefight practice with live ammunition. Household cavalry has dual roles. 250 horses and men serve the Queen as her ceremonial bodyguard. At the same time, the other half of the regiment is ready to go to war. This time on the Queen's cavalry, competition. The two squadrons on ceremonial duty battle it out to prove they have the best turned out troopers. 
even if their horses have other ideas. Others training for battle strive to make the grade and gain a promotion. And the cavalry's new recruits, struggling to stay in the saddle. The cavalry have taken to the hills, on foot. These men are all troopers, the lowest rank in the cavalry. They all have at least two years' experience on the armoured side of the regiment and have also spent up to three years on ceremonial duty. Chosen for their drive and initiative, they are on a gruelling course to earn promotion and become non-commissioned officers, NCOs. Only those who show themselves able to cope and lead under pressure will move up the ranks. Uh, Dilly McCasty, now he is unconscious, but breathing. We're going to get him on the uh, stretcher and start evacuating over. The first test is working together to carry a casualty miles across the moor. Come on, just get to the fence, come on. The instructors are looking for those troopers who have the character and leadership skills to take men into battle. After this warm-up, the men are then sent out on a 20-mile yomp over the top of the moor. Each is carrying the equivalent of a 12-year-old child on their backs. Last year, Trooper James Shaw of the Blues and Royals was on active service in the heat of Iraq. Now he's battling Exmoor. Every time you lift your leg because of the weight, it makes your leg ache, especially if you have to climb over something or you go down on one knee when you stand up. It's hard work. This is James's big chance to move his army career forward. I've done two tours of Iraq. I could have signed off two years ago, left the year ago if I didn't like it, but. I've cracked on. Oh, this is physical. And it is mental as well. As well as military operations, like most cavalrymen, James has also seen his fair share of ceremonial work in London. Well, I was at Knightsbridge for two years, riding the horses and stuff. But Knightsbridge is just there. But mental torture is always working, doing stupid things like cleaning kit, polishing leather, shining breastplates and Stuff like that. Few in the household cavalry can avoid ceremonial duty. The theory is that men who have learnt this discipline make good fighting soldiers. So most find themselves spending the first three years of their careers on the monarch's mounted bodyguard. To guard the queen, these men have to look their very best, a skill that for the last 55 years has been turned into an annual competition, the Princess Elizabeth Cup, also known as the Richmond. With only two weeks to go before the final, Knightsbridge Barracks is a hive of spit and polish. I've been in this room now for four days solid. You just, uh, you came in at, well, I did have a big pile of uh, pizza boxes in the corner there, but I moved them all out, so. Trooper Mike Faulkner has his eyes firmly on the prize. If you win the Richmond Cup, you, uh, you get the title of being a, a clean person. You can, you can do the kit well. Uh, you get a trip to Canada, 250 pounds, and uh, a civvy saddle, civilian riding saddle. So that's not too bad. The Richmond Cup isn't only a competition between individuals, but also between the two regiments that make up the household cavalry the lifeguards who wear white plumed helmets and red tunics, and the blues and royals who sport blue tunics with red plumes. On active military service, they operate together, but at Knightsbridge Barracks, home to ceremonial operations, the lifeguards and blues and royals keep their distinctions clear and their rivalry to the fore. Right, fall in, lifeguards, this end, blues and royals, the other end. The regiments were combined 13 years ago, but the men still live in separate quarters and the horses have separate stables. The intense rivalry between the two regiments is fueled in the run-up to the Princess Elizabeth Cup, when the six smartest troopers from each are pitted against each other, like opposing teams. Trooper Daniel Sherman is representing the Blues and Royals. I was asked to do it, but it was something I wanted to do anyway. 
so I'm quite glad in that respect. So there's always a bit of rivalry between the two squadrons, but um, generally, over the last few years, it's been Blues and Wolves to win it. And uh, I think if we can keep that up, it's all good, good really. It's, it's uh, in front of the Queen, really, which is probably the best thing about it. So you get to see her if you do well enough as well. Oh, I've had dreams before where uh, I've been sitting on top on the actual day and someone's dropped my boots or the horse has fallen over and scratched all his kit and stuff. Yeah, you know, it gets it gets pretty bad with the dreams and stuff. Yeah, quite scary actually. Kieran Fortune, the Blues and Royal Squadron Corporal Major, is making sure his team maintain their winning streak. Oh, Griff, right. you're right. How's it going? I've still got it. That's looking good, mate. Let's have a look. The trickiest part is to clean the horse's cavalry bridle. It's made up of 11 individual pieces of leather and 25 bits of brass. Everything is layered with multiple coats of polish and wax. Oh, that's looking um, nice, mate. No. Yeah, it is, yeah. Quite impressed. I think we stand a good chance of certainly walking away with first and second. I'll be surprised if we don't. But the Blues and Royals cannot be complacent. I think, I think this lad here is going to win. Definitely. Over in the lifeguards' quarters, Trooper Hill and Lance Corporal Armstrong are equally determined to win. You've just got to clean everything, even if you can't see it, clean it. Basically. There's so much, there's so, so much, and there's things, there's things that don't get seen, but they do get cleaned as well. He's like his sides there. There's silly things. What to the untrained eye, most people wouldn't even think about. But to the trained eye, I mean, the, the, the inspecting crew would be like hawks, and they'll be straight in. They'll be straight in on the bits. On Exmoor, the other half of the cavalry face a stark contrast in duties. The army promotes by testing the mettle of its men. Totally exhausted. Would be NCO James Shaw is starting to feel the strain. Final fumes at the moment, are Two miles later, and Trooper Shaw succumbs to exhaustion. Hold on, lads. Let's come off the track, come onto the bit of the side, it's more stable, yeah? Sugar is quickly administered. How long are you feeling the symptoms then? Okay. Say, how long are you feeling these symptoms? When you are threaded gang, you know, you're uh, all day, mate. Incoherent, you. All day. Where in your words? All day, mate. Yeah. A lot of it can be dehydration because you have no idea how how thirsty you actually are when it's cold like this. Have you been drinking not that much water? Uh, I don't suppose so. Uh, no. no. Yeah. Right, the rest of you guys, you feeling all right? Feeling good? Yeah. yeah. Right, no. I'm feel like a million off. bucks, man. I feel all right, but my back's been ripped to pieces. Uh, that's all right. Nice. You got to try and crack off. So we get off this hill, then we're fine. Oh, I've been, I'm trying so. Yeah, definitely. All right. Shaw decides to soldier on. on the radio. <laughs> it's like walking on a bath full of footballs with two people on your back. A mile later, things get worse for Shaw. You all right, mate? For his own right? safety, the staff decide to take James out of the exercise. Right, I'm going to get you off the area. There's no way you're going to be able to crack on all the way to the end. However, what we will do, we'll get you on that transport, and that transport will drop you off at the uh, next stage. All right? All right, sure, just get yourself in the, in the back. Yeah. Shaw will have to wait and see if he will be allowed to continue in the promotion tests. If not, he'll have to wait another year to try again. After eight hours on the hill, the rest of his patrol pass through the snow line and safely make it down to the coast. Combermere Barracks in Windsor is home to the Household Cavalry's training wing. Last week, 12 new troopers started to learn to ride from scratch. In 16 weeks, they'll be on ceremonial duty. Simply mounting their horse was hard for some, particularly Trooper Glenn Forrest. A little daunting, just to say the least. It's more difficult than we expected because it's more technique than his strength. Over the last week, they have learned how to walk, trot, and fall off. Ride home! 
Today, they're going to discover how to go a bit faster. First canter is going to be absolute carnage. <laughs> right in front of your horses! But it should be a good laugh anyway if we do. We've got horses and bodies everywhere, so looking forward to it being a good laugh. Right! Quick's the best. No! Oh, straight on top! Take up At the least Trooper Forrest is finding it a bit easier to get on. OK, this morning brings a little present. Your first canter. OK. All it is is just a third gear. Just goes a little bit faster. A few of you a bit apprehensive, not really looking forward to it. OK, but believe me, by the end of it, you've had a good canter. OK, you will. That's all you're going to want to do is just get faster and faster. The next thing you'll be saying, can we go out in the park? Can we have a race? And all this sorts of stuff. Now then. Positive with the legs, so ride, walk, march. Close the legs on, shorten the rein. Turn, roll. Heels down, stay relaxed. Good transition, let's keep it there. But before Lance Corporal of Horse Lee Golder can help them find third gear, Seymour, tired of amateurs, decides to dump trooper Ben Hansen. Ride, halt. The KC corner, canter. Come on then, look at him. These horses are far more experienced than their riders, and they take every opportunity to remind them. Sit back. Oh, Jesus. Get in the trap. Don't be so bloody wet. Get it going forward, man! Come to them, Forrest. Kick the bloody thing. Finally, Vesuvius decides he's had enough and takes it out on Forrest. Anything? Right. Then we get a fork and dig that corner back in for us. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good fall, though. Good roll. I like that. Right, let's trot. And ride the road quietly, calmly. Yeah, we've nicked that in the tank, sudden impact. So. <laughs> we'll get all the big learning curve end up there. Well, to say the least. Okay, I have the greatest sympathy for you, Tank. Whoa, whoa, whoa! I mean, I know you're not supposed to laugh at anyone else with misfortune, but. Uh... <laughs> Thank you, snob off. Yeah, come on. Just have a quick one, you big kid. How was it, alright? It's very early in the morning. Judgment Day in the Richmond Cup. All through the night, six lads from the lifeguards and six from the Blues and Royals have been up cleaning their kit. The tidiest, cleanest and smartest man will be presented to the Queen. Just did final preparation. That's it. And uh, just goes to get dressed now. Lifeguard Mick Hill's boots look immaculate, but he's still not satisfied. To the untrained eye, that is one hell of a good looking boot. And it is, but to the eagle eyes and the people inspecting, it looks very shiny, it looks done. But it, it needs more, full stop. Over in the Blues and Royals kit room, trooper Mike Faulkner is making one final effort. It's probably the most strenuous thing I've ever done. Uh, and I've got, yeah, I've got butterflies. It didn't really hit me until last night. Well, about four o'clock this morning. And uh, at the moment, yeah, I'm very nervous. Outside, the riders' pit crews are adding the final touches to their mounts. Basra's having a pedicure. All that we're doing here now is just making sure that the silver bits are silver so it stands out. The pressure is also building for Trooper Daniel Sherman. It's all go today. He hasn't really stopped since 4.30 this morning. Um, just going upstairs now to start getting changed. I had a mad rush trying to get all the horses groomed, get all the tack ready, get new shoes and the horse buffed down because everything's got to be perfect. Disaster strikes in the Blues and Royals tack room. Things are literally starting to fall apart for Mike Faulkner. <sighs> well, basically, the uh, watch out, Minister. You've got the, the crest of the breastplate, the peninsula brass. You can, well, you can't, but you're not supposed to, but you can take them out to clean round it, make it easier to clean. And that's come out, and one of the pins have snapped. 
And so now it can't go back in. So we're through the process at the moment of supergluing it back on. Superglue is not in the rule book. Lots of important people are judging us, and I think they'll just be looking at everything in, in real detail. So, uh, you know, so just make sure everything is as perfect as I can get it, and then seeing how they judge it on that. So. The squadron corporal major wants to get the show on the road. Yeah, fine. I'll tell you what, they'll have to shave in them boots. Oh, nice. The men's nervousness is starting to infect the horses. And things don't start well for the red team, the lifeguards. Warlord decides to take Trooper Hill back to his stable. Finally, the bed sheets that protect the immaculate leather are whisked away. You've all put a tremendous amount of effort into turning yourself out. Make it count, show yourself off, and I'm sure you will succeed. Thank you very much indeed. The independent inspection team enter stage left. Major Mark Goodwin Hudson of the Blues and Royals is not allowed to be one of the judges. He's hoping it'll be a hat-trick of wins for his regiment. As an officer, when I'm doing an inspection, I start first of all with a horse's head and I look at all the, the horse's head kit. And the things that stand out immediately are the nose band, the brow band and the edges and the brasses. Then moving your head up to the soldier, the first thing that strikes you is his cuirass, his helmet and his plume. And how, generally how the soldier carries himself whether he's sitting on parade looking confident, ready to go out there and, and be part of the Queen's lifeguard. In the peaceful hills of Sennybridge, it's the next phase of the selection tests for the 16 men hoping for promotion. This morning, the hills are alive with the sound of... This time, they're being tested in the lethal art of firefighting. They'll use live ammunition, real bullets. When we get onto live, Step one, throwing a live grenade. Right. Has anyone here not thrown a grenade at all? Their Ooh. instructor, Colour Sergeant Nathan Bell, is a weapons specialist whose job is to teach them how to kill the enemy and not each other. Right, you'll have your grenade out and ready. Once you're happy, you pull the pin, from the grenade. I'll then say, OK, throw. OK, you quickly bop up, identify the target, OK, and then throw your grenade. All right, it's a complete <laughs> stick and he's dropped it. Clearly, I'm not going to take this amount of time. Right, if you've dropped it, do not attempt to retrieve the grenade. There'll be some obvious cover. Don't wait for me to prompt you. Get your ass over the other side of the cover. Obviously, as a safety staff, I'll do my best to grab you by your kit and we're both going in the opposite direction from where you've dropped the grenade from which point we'll take cover and we'll wait for it to go off. Once it's gone off, I'll probably call you all the names under the sun and we'll crack on. Remove the pin and after four seconds, the device will explode, hurling hundreds of steel balls, killing and maiming anybody within 50 yards. In the last 10 years, the Household Cavalry has seen action in Northern Ireland, Bosnia, Kosovo and Iraq. Despite his collapse on Exmoor, Trooper James Shaw has been allowed to continue in the selection process. You're suppressing the enemy while you're trying to withdraw, and obviously he can't pop his head up to shoot you. If you're putting rounds down on his position, he's hiding behind a rock. All he can hear is rounds pinging off that rock. He's not going to want to stick his head up and uh, put a round in your head. You've got to remember, OK, no movement without fire, OK? Do just think about, you've got a pepper pot. You've got to leapfrog each other to make the drill start working, otherwise it's just going to slow down like it did there in a pace. I think, lads, yeah? You've got to use the dead ground. OK, no bad effort, off you go. In the next combat setup, Shaw and his patrol are going to be tested in an ambush scenario. The eight-man patrol is about to be attacked, or contacted, by the enemy.
Once fired on, the team spread out parallel with the enemy contact and return heavy fire. The patrol starts to retreat, covering each other, known in the trade as pepper potting. Without close teamwork, they could easily shoot each other instead of the enemy. The machine gun team provide most of the firepower. The patrol uses a riverbed to take cover and then starts to break contact with the enemy. Didn't kill him, mate. We scared him. We scared him. Oh, yeah. oh, sorry, I shouldn't say that. But yeah, I thought it was good. In Knightsbridge, an ordeal of a very different kind is far from over. The best turned out troopers have been sitting to attention for nearly two hours. Things are looking good for the Blues and Royals until Daniel Sherman starts to suffer the Guardsman's worst humiliation, fainting on parade. Sherman, you're almost there. How are you getting on? Major Goodwin Hudson is on hand to administer the cavalry's cure all, a boiled sweet. Weeks of effort and sleep deprivation have taken their toll. Sherman retires. We're taking Sherman off because he's, um, he's feeling pretty faint and he's been working so hard. I mean, these boys have been working flat out um, for the last week in terms of working at all their extra time to repair the kit and then get the kit ready. The Blues and Royals winning streak is under threat. Sherman is out of the running, and now Faulkner has a problem. His superglue patch-up has given up. One or two things um, people have forgotten, like, you know, if you're going to take your, your peninsula brass off your breastplate... <laughs> Did he not put the thing on the back? It's got to go back on properly. Yeah. Yeah. Can we just bring them up, please? Today, turn, carry swords! Gentlemen, I want to pass on my heartiest congratulations to you. I thought the standard of turnout was exceptional. I congratulate all of you. Well done. Gents, dismount and return your swords. But still, no one knows if the winner will be from the lifeguards or the Blues and Royals. It's a closely guarded secret until the Queen presents the trophy in a week's time. I'm not going to start making predictions or, uh, or run my mouth off. No, I've done myself justice anyway. I do think I gave myself a good representation, and I'm happy with that. But Mike Faulkner is worried that his damaged horse brass may have ruled him out of the competition. I didn't even know it had fallen off until halfway through the inspection when someone told me that it was hanging off. To know that I'd put all that effort into, uh, into that kit, and I can't swear on camera, but yeah, it did annoy me, yeah. And Daniel Sherman is putting on a brave face after his fainting fit. So I've done it other praise before, and that's never happened. Oh, oh, ill, really ill, you know. Um, sweating and then, yeah, it's a shame about that. At least I've done it now. It's all done and dusted. Cheers, Thank you very much. After a gruelling two months, Trooper Shaw has passed his junior leader's course. He and the survivors prepare for their pass-out parade. Even though he collapsed in the snow, Shaw was allowed to carry on. It's partly my own fault because I didn't uh, administer myself properly. You know, I mean, not enough water, not enough food, that's why I collapsed, but that was definitely one of the hardest points for me. If I get promoted, then, uh, yeah, it means more money, uh, more responsibility, which is, which is good in a way because it changes your job perspective. I mean, I've been a trooper for five years now, and uh, your job changes when you get promoted. As the men wait for the adjutant, the heavens open. It rains, hails, sleets and snows on their parade. But an April shower is not going to put the British Army off a nice bit of drill.
0205. Congratulations, a good effort. Bye, the left! It's the Royal Windsor Horse Show. After a week of waiting, the finalists in the Princess Elizabeth Cup are about to discover who the winner is in front of the Queen. In charge is Captain Richard Moja. At the moment, the boys aren't quite sure who's, who's come top out of the eight or so of them. Uh, and they'll find out today, and the Queen will present <laughs> a trophy to the, the best turnout man. Um, they don't know, I don't know. I think very few people do. And I think that really, I think they're pretty nervous to find out who it is. It's a very competitive, um, event. They're not really rushing too much, so they're obviously feeling quite well prepared for this. Following their disasters in the judging, troopers Faulkner and Sherman haven't made the top eight. Instead, they have to help behind the scenes. The eight finalists in the World Cup of Perfect Presentation enter the Royal Showground to find out finally who has won the Princess Elizabeth Cup. For once, it's not one of the Blues and Royals. Trooper Wyselli of the Lifeguards takes the coveted prize. I didn't really expect me to win it. I was thinking one of the Blues was going to win it. But then when they mentioned my name, I was like, yeah, I've done it now. The next three places go to the Blues and Royals. Trooper Mick Hill of the Lifeguards comes fifth. I'll take fifth. It's better, it's better than 12th, isn't it? So, uh, can't, can't complain, you know. I don't, I don't think there's a man out there who, who wouldn't say he didn't want to win it, you know, he wouldn't want to win it, but it's not to be, maybe next year. Unfortunately, when the men are presented to the Queen, nerves get the better of Captain Moja's charger, Acrobat. Horse has got to go, horse has got to go. I think uh, Her Majesty understands horses, so at the end of the day, the horse is its own animal, and there you are. To add injury to insult, Acrobat then gives Her Majesty a cheeky nudge. I better go and make my apologies somewhere, otherwise I'll be locked up in the tower, I think. <laughs> Next time on the Queen's Cavalry, will pride come before a fall? I'm pretty confident I'm not fall off. On the Queen's lifeguard, there's a trooper in trouble. You've obviously not bothered your ass. And Corporal of Horse Bentley invades Surrey. Where are we, Rich? In the middle of Farnham Town Centre. Household cavalry has dual roles. 250 horses and men serve the Queen as her ceremonial bodyguard. At the same time, the other half of the regiment is ready to go to war. This time on the Queen's cavalry, the armoured regiment goes to town. It's not as every day you see one of these driving down the uh, your local village or through the town centre. Five weeks into riding school, but will pride come before a fall for our learner riders? Oh, I'm pretty confident I'm not fall off. And Knightsbridge Barracks witness a trooper in trouble. You're taking a dirty horse on parade. You've obviously not bothered your ass. Knightsbridge Barracks are home to the Household Cavalry's two sister squadrons, the Lifeguards and the Blues and Royals. Every day follows the exact same ritual. 
It's 6 a.m. and the Blues and Royals are getting ready for their daily early morning exercise, right. known as watering order. Squadron leader Major Mark Goodwin Hudson is in command. It's called watering order because in the past we used to ride out to all the different water troughs in London. Sadly, there aren't very many water troughs left. This is all possible thanks to an ancient privilege granted to the household cavalry. In the morning, we can get anywhere we want to in London, as long as we're back by 8 o'clock. So you can go as far north, east, south or west. Today, they're heading for the wide open spaces of Wormwood Scrubs. Mark's route leads the men through some of West London's most desirable areas. Exercise to and for Corporal Major Kieran Fortune, it's a return to very familiar territory. I'm from West London anyway, so uh, whenever I've been at the operational regiment and I come back here, it's always nice. I feel at home sort of going around the streets of West London, uh, particularly going up to the Scrubs area, because that's, that's, that's where I'm from. And, uh, you know, the old happy memories of childhood come back playing football on the Scrubs, and now <laughs> I'm up there with, uh, with the lads and the horses. It's, it's, it's good fun. A lot of these guys won't have been up to the scrubs before, so it'll, it'll be a bit of a, a treat to get up there and, and give the horses a good, a good canter around Wormwood Scrubs um, and, then get, and then get back for breakfast. The 14-mile round trip is the ideal way to keep the horses fit for the demands of the ceremonial season. I think they love it. It's good fresh air. It's fun for them. Um, and it's got to be more interesting than sitting in a stall. Traditionally, new troopers start their army careers in the Windsor Riding School. They are expected to master the art of horsemanship in only 16 weeks. It's week five for the latest batch of new recruits. They've learned to trot, they've learned to canter, and they've learned to fall off. Now, they face their biggest challenge, jumping, where hitting the ground is par for the course. The ride has started a kitty. Each time someone falls off, in cavalry slang, being binned, the victim is forced to dig into their pocket. Well, this is the, uh, the being binned tin, and how it works is uh, when you fall off the first time, it's five pounds. Basically, it goes towards uh, a, chari a yeah, charity of our cause. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a, um, just a, yeah, a night out, get some beers together, celebrate. Get All the bumps and bruises. <laughs> they may be only two days into jumping, but already the coffers are swelling. Um, what's in there? Trooper Richie Metcalf is one of the few recruits who rode before he joined up. He's confident he won't have to part with any cash at all. It's all about seat, relaxing and breathing. You fall off and you tense up. If you tense up, you're going to fall off no matter what. And I'm so chilled out. You are going to fall off, trust me. I'm not going to fall off. No. Everybody. Everybody, no matter you could be you a little Frank bit on me. and you will get binned. I'm not going to get binned. You're going to get binned. Tan, I'm not going to get binned. But for some of the other riders, it's becoming a costly exercise. At the other end of the confidence scale is Graham Thompson. Yeah, again. Tom, I owe some money because he's um, he's fallen up. He is our crash test dummy. Sit up, that guy, you bloody right. You just feel it. Listen. Energy underneath you just carrying you basically sit on a cannonball. You just got to abandon yourself to either go to hospital. It's quite a frightening experience. Even just a small jump like that is quite a hurdle to get over. It's a real test of courage that. Thompson! Tall! Shoulders back, hands it up! Right, hold! Yeah. I've not got any money on me. I've not got any money on me. But I will pay up. I will pay. Yeah. How much? How much is it? Twenty-five, thirty pence. Something like that. Cocky Metcalf remains convinced he'll never have to pay up. No, I'm, 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 I'
pretty confident I'll not fall off. And that calf thinks he's going to make it through without falling off. I'll have him. I'll have him in the jumping lane. <laughs> In West London, the early morning joggers have company. It's the cavalry. After a gallop round the scrubs, there's a welcome treat for both men and horses. Kieran Fortune's parents still live in West London and have turned up with coffee and croissants. I, I will do my it's become something of a tradition. Thank you very much. It's fortunate. Thank you. We should do this more often. It's not the only family military tradition. We're not surprised he's in the army because his grandfather was in the army and uh, his uncle was in the, in the Irish Guards, stationed at Windsor, and his great grandfather was in the army. There's no time for a second cup. The Blues and Royals must be back in Knightsbridge. After this, they've got a full day of ceremonial duty. In the Windsor Riding School, the 12 new recruits are in the jumping lane. But Lance Corporal of Horse Lee Golders in a mean mood and looking for donations to the bin pot. They've got to accept that when they get into that lane, the horse is going to go at Mach 10 and they're going to jump three fences. And the quicker they accept that, uh, then the easier it's going to be. Where are you going? The lane's that way. Everyone's paid into the binning bucket so far, with one notable exception. Metcalf. He's managed to remain firmly in the saddle a fact he's been boasting about. Well done! No, he, he didn't fall off at all, and he started gloating about it, which was probably his biggest downfall. And then uh, he got into a conversation with um, uh, with one of the officers. He said that, he said to me I was going to fall off, and I said, no, no, no. And then he said, right, up your money then. So what to? He said, about 60 quid. So I said, OK, fair enough, 60 quid. Maybe it's the size of the new wager, nearly half his weekly pay packet. But suddenly, Metcalf's confidence dips. First time I did it, my first jump I went down, I did a very sneaky hang on. I came out the side of it, and I half his neck and stayed on. And at that point, I knew I was coming out. I started shaking and everything because I, I wasn't confident at all. I was shaking his head, he goes, I shouldn't have made the deal. I shouldn't have made the deal. And then uh, next time he went over, <laughs> he came off and everyone just erupted. <laughs> did you hear about that? and I've just paid very dear for opening my gob. To teach him a little humility, Lance Corporal of Horse Lee Golder sends Metcalf round again, without his horse. 60 quid is going in the pot. Makes a change, Metcalf. In London, the changing of the Queen's lifeguard is the household cavalry's most famous and repetitive role. It alternates daily between the two squadrons, the Blues and Royals and the Lifeguards. At exactly 10 a.m. every single day, the guard is inspected by the orderly officer. Today, it's the turn of Captain Rob Gibbs of the Blues and Royals. Queen's Lifeguard is up and ready for your inspection. Thank you, Corporal. All right, sir. Thanks very much. This, the Queen's official bodyguard, will be on duty in front of London's tourists. The eyes of the world will be upon them, so Rob's inspection must be thorough. We need to be up to the required standard of, of sharpness, smartness and shininess, um, just to make sure that um, we maintain the standards of the British Army and what's expected of us. Yeah. Good black kit. So far, today's guard is making a good impression. Good boots. Good boots. They are nice boots. Well done. But for one trooper, Sam Bass, fresh from a week off, it's about to go horribly wrong. Right, that head stall is absolutely disgusting. Bass, you know the form on this. You know what to do. Shouldn't have to pick you up on something so schoolboy. You're taking a dirty horse on parade. It's not good, is it? OK, you're not impressing me so far. Tarnished helmet. You sweat on the inside of your boots. Your sword needs to go to the armourer and it's covered in uh, polish. 
How much time did you spend doing your kit? Six hours. Seven hours no, you didn't. I did, sir. You didn't. Well, you're probably on your mobile phone and smoking cigarettes for about five of that. All of these men here, so far, have put in a very good effort. You haven't. I'm just deliberating what punishment to give you. You've obviously not bothered your ass. I am not impressing you today, Bass. OK, you are substandard by a long way. Sam Bass has a long day ahead, but Old Hand Commando has seen it all before. By the front, quick, march. Twenty-five miles away in Windsor, the fighting half of the household cavalry is also going for a ride in their iron horses. Richard Bentley's scimitar armoured reconnaissance vehicle has the equivalent of 190 horses under the bonnet. Today, he's going for a road and cross-country test. The eight-ton scimitar is a tricky drive on the roads. The driver has a very restricted view. Richard must be his eyes and ears. His rear view mirror and his yeah, mirror. He's got a low rear view mirror, so I'm, I'm keeping the check off behind. I can see pretty much directly to the left and the right. Uh, he's, he's, he's tunnel vision in the way, because obviously he's lowered down the same in front of me. Most road users do generally tend to slow down when they see uh, a vehicle like this. Oh, it's, not, it's not as every day you see one of these driving down you know, through your local village or through the town centre. But as they approach Farnham, they find themselves navigationally challenged. This doesn't look like the approach to the tank testing ground. Go straight up, mate. Straight up. But straight up leads them straight down Farnham High Street. Yeah. What way we go? Uh, that's a bloody good question, that is, mate. Do you know what? That is a good question. I'll just hop both lanes, so... Uh, do you know what? I don't know. Where are, where are we, Richard? We're in the middle of Farnham Town Centre. As you can see, all the shops, pedestrians, traffic lights, pubs. Far, Farnham Park's right. You've not got aircon in this? No, it's, it, this is the aircon, stick your head out. <laughs> we're having photos <laughs> taken now. Yeah. Quick decision go right, time. Go right. Turning right turns out to be wrong. Easy, easy. Okay, okay, go Richard may have survived Bosnia, but now he's snared in Farnham's deadly one-way system. Left, mate. A minute later, they're back where they started. Straight up, mate, and then the lights we go left. Back for another go, look. Reshooting. Still nipple look right. Yeah, go left, mate. We'll, we'll go left. Left looks good, mate. In Knightsbridge, Captain Rob Gibbs has finished his inspection of the Queen's lifeguard. Today is a long guard, which means Her Majesty is in residence, and there's the, the officer, the court major and trumpeter going down, so that's an extra three men. Um, normally, when Her Majesty's away, it's a short guard, and that's only 12 men, so it's a few less. Um, today, they do the handover at uh, Horse Guards Parade with the lifeguards. The lifeguards will come back here and do a dismount, and then the Blues and Royals. Draw your swords! There's been a sudden change at the palace. Her Majesty's plans have obviously changed. Uh, when Her Majesty's ch uh, plans change, it'll now change down to a uh, short guard. So we'll have uh, the court major not going on with the, without the officer, and there won't be the trumpet trumpeter going on. I think there'll be a few delighted people not having to go on guard as well. So. Uh... The baggage wagon is travelling down with the troops to horse guards, and Major Mark Goodwin Hudson has hitched a ride. This morning we're on the guard van and we're following the Queen's lifeguard and the guard van was donated by Queen Victoria so that all the baggage and the necessary bits of equipment that the guard needed could be taken down behind them on the way to horse guards. The route leads them down Constitution Hill, past Buckingham Palace where they salute the monarch. Guard van, eyes! Right!
Then it's on down the mile towards Whitehall and Horse Guards Parade. They have to reach Horse Guards at 11 a.m. precisely. Timing is everything. Fortunately, they have a very good clock to rely on. And of course, when you're riding on a cavalry black, holding your state sword in your right hand and you've got the reins in your left hand, you have no opportunity to look at your watch. So Big Ben is a key marker and your first real indication of how long you've got to get to horse guards. Horse Guards is the official entrance to Buckingham Palace. The Queen's lifeguard have maintained their vigil here for over 250 years. Every day, hundreds of visitors come to see the changing of the guard. For most tourists, this is a unique experience in London's living history. But for the commander of the regiment, Colonel Hammond Massey, it's a daily event. His office overlooks the parade ground. From here, he keeps an eagle eye on his troops. All right, well, look, Simon, I'm going to switch you across. To me, it symbolizes uh, the continuity uh, of our system, our head of state. Uh, it does honor, if you like, to our head of state, the Queen. And I hope it is showing the rest of our countrymen uh, the embodiment of excellence and, I hope, devotion to duty, uh, attention to detail, of which we in the House of Cavalry uh, are very proud. The barracks, known as the Chits, were built in 1742. Ever since then, they've been home to the Sovereign's lifeguard. For the next 24 hours, horse guards will be home to these men and horses of the Blues and Royals. The departing lifeguards report on the events of the last shift. It's been quite a circle from one incident I had with a certain young lady. Really? About, 11, about 15 minutes after I got on guard, the guys had just taken over. The alarm was rung in the box, so I went out to see what was going on, and there was a woman harassing the uh, sentry in the box and the civilians. I asked the uh, sentry what she was doing. She was just swearing at him, calling him all kinds of names and the civilians' names, as she was going to pour their eyes out. Really? So I asked her to leave. Did she obey you? No, not really. She just pulled her tongue out at me. Really? She didn't seem all there, actually. So uh, I got one of the local police officers to have a word, and they moved her on. That's it for another hour. Corporal of Horse Richard Bentley has escaped Farnham. He's made it to the tank testing ground. Because they can be called into action at short notice, the household cavalry have to check their vehicles are always ready for combat. Over the last 30 years, the scimitar has seen action in the Falklands, Bosnia, Kosovo and the Gulf. They're quite good when you think about how old they are. I mean, um, you know, they've been going since the 60s. You can, you, can, you can take these things anywhere, they're gleaming. I mean, they're fantastic. In combat, four scimitars are grouped together in a self-sufficient troop. All the kit we need to maintain the vehicle and, and the weapon systems, um, camouflage and concealment kit, everything, and all the aids we might use, like thermal um, optics and stuff like that, our own personal weapons, our own personal kit, uh, food, water, ammunition, it's all contained on that vehicle, so we can basically live off that vehicle um, in some cases, but it might have to be up to, say, five days. It's imperative the small crew are able to work closely together. A three-man crew, driver's sitting there where Shane's been sitting uh, this morning, this afternoon. Myself will be sitting on the left-hand side up here, and on the far right-hand side, we'd have the uh, gunner. The scimitar is armed with a 30mm cannon that can take out similar armoured vehicles at ranges of nearly a mile. It also has a machine gun that can fire 750 rounds per minute. In the last Gulf War, one actually took on two Iraqi main battle tanks and a troop carrier, coming out the victor. In the army, comfort is not a priority. 
When the scimitar is fully loaded up, there's not much room for anything else. Target! The rounds we'd actually put, we've got stowage here for, for the main arm and the 30mm, and underneath here, if I, if I pop that up, it slides forward. Uh, we can stow a total of 201 rounds of main armament. Um, we've got stowage racks behind the uh, gunner uh, and the commander in the corners. And we've also got a rack, what we call a wine rack, at the back here. Where we put main armament rounds uh, behind that netting in, in these slots here. It is cramped in here. As you see, I'm, I'm six foot two. Um, uh, and, you know, there's not a lot of room down here. I mean, you, you, when all the kit's in here and I'm board and the bins are all full, there's actually, there's probably not a, an ounce of space that you can put anything. We literally get stuff, you know, in every, uh, every little nook and cranny we can. However, there's one item the British Army just can't do without. This little grey box here is the, uh, the mainstay of the vehicle. That's the BV, the boiling vessel. Uh, there's a tap here, and all we do is to make a quick brew, just press the old button, and the old water comes out. Get close as a crew, get to know each other, get on each other's nerves now and again. Um, you know, we're all uh, one big happy team at the end of the day, and that's and when it's working well. You know, it, it, it does show, and it is good. At Horse Guards, the ceremonial side of the Household Cavalry's duties is in full swing. Trooper Sam Bass, fresh from his grilling at the hands of Captain Gibbs, has an hour of mounted duty to contemplate the error of his ways. When the sun's out, so like your helmet starts to hurt towards the end of the hour, and um, you're starting to sweat a lot. But, um, you know, you persevere through it, and then afterwards you come back in. You feel, you feel good after you've done it as well. People pay com compliments to you and stuff, so it's good. Bass is lucky. He could be on foot duty for two hours, at the mercy of the tourists desperate for a souvenir of England. It's a lot harder, and as you see, you're on your feet for an hour, so you, you feel the effects a lot more. You can only say two things to him, which is a stay out of the chits and uh, stand clear of the guard. People go, you know, actually grab hold of you a lot more as well, so you get quite a, uh, a few uh, people grabbing hold of the bits you don't want them to. Behind the scenes, life is far more tranquil. But a hundred years ago, this was a much noisier place. Archaeologists recently found remains of a cockfighting pit in the building. Today, the troopers are more likely to be found in the cookhouse, or even snatching a rest between duties. But there's no let up for Trooper Bass. Busy preparing for the second inspection of the day, he's got a moment to reflect on where it all went wrong. Oh, I've just come back from leave, I had three weeks off. So I've had three weeks at home chilling out, you know, getting used to civilian life again. And then I uh, had to come back here. And I was found I was on Queens the next day, so I cleaned my kit. And uh, I tried, I think I just spent too much time on my boots. Because, you know, I just chucked them in my locker before I went on leave. So, as you know, let's, I reckon about, because I'm bouncing them out now for about, about a month of this, so about the third, fourth guard, be back into the routine. Just easily forget, to, uh, forget what you saw. Bass is on Queen's guard duty for the next month, but his long-term plans are more uncertain. Now I'm getting out after my four years. Of course, I, I, I joined the army because I had uh, my, my girlfriend was pregnant, so... I got, we got engaged and I decided that I should stay out, stay out of trouble, I should join the army. It's always something I wanted to do as a kid. And uh, as soon as I got it, then like, I sort of, I've done like two years and I'm so much wiser. I mean, I'm not the same person I was when I joined all that time ago. So it's alright now. As soon as I get out, I'll be able to uh, find a nice job, I've got some qualifications now. Sort my life out and look after my kid. Corporal of Horse Peter Ireland comes up to check on Bass. He's a seasoned soldier and is well drilled on the rigorous standards expected by Captain Rob Gibbs. My shoes are probably better than your boots. They are better. They are better than your boots, that's all they are. It's 3.45 and Rob arrives for the four o'clock inspection. He just has time for a special apple bobbing treat for his favourite charger, Sunningdale. For Bass, though, time is running out. It's how quick you've got to do it, though, Corporal. You know, it's like you can't do it as good as you do it if you're back at camp. Can you? Yeah, you can. 
speed, isn't it? It's yeah. I'm, I'm on a routine. Rob Gibbs' four o'clock inspection is part of a long tradition. It dates back to an incident when no guards came out to salute Queen Victoria as she passed by. They were caught in their shirt sleeves, drinking beer and playing cards. As punishment, she ordered that for a hundred years at four o'clock every day, the guard must be inspected. The tradition continues. This is Woodward, sir. Woodward? <laughs> Good lad. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good opportunity to make sure that my naughty boys from the inspection this morning um, have rectified a few of their uh, errors. For Sam Bass, it's the moment of truth. A second bad showing will land him on a charge. Okay, let's, let's not let yourself down here. Let's look smart. You're in the public eye. So forget the cartouche box, okay? Okay. Good improvement. Well done, Bass. It's good. Good improvement. Satisfied, Rob Gibbs heads back to Knightsbridge. Bass may have got away with it today, but he has another month of these duties ahead of him. I don't know, I don't know, I, didn't, I felt it was a little unfair on his behalf, but he was doing his job at the end of the day, and the first man he saw, you learn from your mistakes, and uh, I'll take it with me on the next guard. Next time on the Queen's Cavalry, full armour. Steel horses charge into battle. All those enemies to the north are to be hunted down and destroyed. And the new troopers put on their breastplates, preparing to guard the Queen for the very first time. This is something that I've wanted to do for absolutely years, and to be part of doing it now, it's spectacular. This time on the Queen's Cavalry, the two roles of the Household Cavalry, guarding the Queen and armoured warfare. Iron horses charge into battle. All those enemies to the north are to be hunted down and destroyed. And the new troopers don their breastplates, preparing for their very first royal duty. This is something that I've wanted to do for absolutely years, and to be part of doing it now, it's spectacular. On the prairies of central Canada, the British Army has 2,690 square kilometres of nothing much at all. This is where they train for war. A virtual battle is about to begin. The Household Cavalry is here in strength. Their mission, to attack the British Army. We're basically a hard-hitting, fast-moving, three-thinking and aggressive enemy. And this is where the gloves come off. The Household Cavalry's armoured regiment is taking the part of the enemy, known here as Opposition Forces, or OPFOR for short. Commanding them is Colonel Charlie Clee. He's dealing with a battlefield where the landmarks sound like a giant game of Monopoly. Push south and start to work the route between Strand and Mayfair, uh, roughly speaking, between the... This is going to be their second exercise this month. And so far, they've been doing rather too well. During Chameleon, which is the exercise we did immediately before this, they, uh, 
they, they thought they'd identified my location and they put nine batteries and guns and two Harriers onto me. Uh, sadly, the fire control officer or the forward observation officer who called down that strike actually called it down on himself and killed himself. Uh, but I understand that uh, the commanding officer of the battle group has offered a week's leave uh, to, uh, to, to any call sign that kills, kills my tank. Being targeted in an exercise scenario may sound like fun, but it's a vital tool for preparing men for the real thing. March 2003. D Squadron spearheaded the invasion of Iraq. The squadron launched an operation 40 kilometers forward of the front line into the rear of the Iraqi 16th Armored Division. They suffered three dead and four wounded. But it could have been worse if they hadn't spent the preceding four months honing their skills. The exercise is one giant war game. To generate maximum realism and training value, an unseen and neutral commander manipulates the whole event. And this is the Games Masters HQ. It's my game. It's my train set at this stage. Brigadier Patrick Marriott commanded British land forces during the invasion in the last Gulf War. So they've, lost, they've slightly lost the enemy now in terms of death. Now he's in control of a virtual war. He's the only person who can see what both sides are up to. Battery commander does not know what's going to happen. And I train him and put him through a number of different training objectives, then I can decide the sort of things I want to put him through. Uh, and if, he get, if he's good, it gets worse for him. If he's bad, it probably gets a bit easier. Here in the control centre, the movement of every man, machine and bullet is monitored. These are modern war games. Nothing or no one is destroyed. A Challenger tank costs over £4 million, far too valuable to risk. But the aim is to create something as close to real war as possible, so live ammunition is replaced with lasers. Lance Corporal Peter Townsend is the expert. First of all, we've got the RDUs, which are the um, retro detector units, and they detect when the laser's being fired at you. Also, within the lasers comes a strobe light, which gives out a warning so other vehicles know when you've actually been hit. So if you're hit and destroyed, they will keep flashing. If you're just hit and you haven't been destroyed, they will just flash a couple of times and then stop flashing. At the front here, that's the actual laser. Um, when you fire, it comes out of there, hopefully hitting the other vehicle and I'm um, destroying it. On the front, you've got the big black box with brown cartridges in. That's the flashbang smoke simulator. So when you fire, one of them will go off and it will give a puff of smoke and a sound so they can actually know who's firing at them and where from as well. It's not just the vehicles which are wired to headquarters. Every trooper is also linked to the computer system. What we've got here is the uh, Area Weapon Simulated Effects Vests. Every soldier on the battlefield will wear this and uh, with various electronic equipment inside, will know the position of every soldier on the battlefield. Attached to the front of the soldier's rifle is a laser and the soldier will have to activate this laser via the vest prior to carrying out any engagements and he can then fire his weapon in exactly the same manner that he would on, the, on a proper battlefield. If a soldier's fired at, the vest will indicate as to whether that soldier's been taken out or if bullets are just sort of shooting past his head. The fear's still there really. As soon as the bullets start coming close to the guys, they start running around doing the normal stuff they would in a real sort of combat situation. Built up, uh, a the household cavalry are playing the enemy. Mission one kicks off tomorrow in D plus 22. Our immediate objective, crossings over the river Suffield. Our secondary objective, crossings over the river Fairhurst. Their mission tomorrow, advance 20 miles through the enemy battle group lines, cross two rivers and seize the land beyond. Everybody clear so far? But until they receive the order to advance at dawn, all they can do is wait. For Lieutenant David crosthwaite Air, fresh from officers training at Sandhurst, it's his first taste of operations in his new regiment. We are all resting, reading, and uh, writing letters home, um, getting a shower, very important. I'm going to try and persuade my operator to have a shower, because otherwise I'm sharing a tent with him, like he is, which I don't want to. <laughs> Trooper David Willis has been in the regiment for three years. This is like a, every kid's dream, and you know, you join the army, you drive tanks around a field, you blow stuff up, it's all good. Most members of the Household Cavalry find their careers oscillating between fighting wars and protecting the Queen. 
In three months' time, David will be back on ceremonial duties in London. At the end of the year, I can go up to Knightsbridge and do the next phase of my uh, career, get some promotion, and then hopefully make my way up through the ranks and come back out here probably as a commander. You know, you go from tanks one, one year, and then all of a sudden you're up Knightsbridge, middle of London, best of both worlds, as they say. <laughs> On the other side of the world, 4,000 miles away in Windsor, the cavalry's latest trainee troopers have spent the last six weeks learning to ride. It's the school of hard knocks. Sit back quietly. Well done. Oh, oh. Ride. Halt. Today, they have their first big assessment. Everyone knows that if one of them fails the test, they all have to take it again but if they pass, they are rewarded with three days home leave. We also get our spurs if we do this today as well. So get awarded our spurs. If everything goes all well, we get to go home. So it's for 72 hours, so it's all worthwhile, man. I just hope everything goes well. Man. Well, that's it. You have got exactly six minutes. Hurry up. Lance Corporal of Horse Mark Jaworski is responsible for their performance. The way they turn themselves out, i.e. the riding boots, the personal dress, the way the horse is groomed and the tack that the horse is wearing is down to me. I think they're flapping a bit about it, but this should be all right. The man they've got to impress won his own spurs over 20 years ago. Captain Mark Averson. Good morning, sir. Now, our crossing is formed up and awaiting your inspection, sir. Thank you very much. OK, here we go, then. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning, sir. No, I've got some running weight in your inspection. It's not a good start. Start again. Trooper Hook and Ride Zulu, sir. Okay, have you been in the lead file all the time? Uh, second day, sir. Get your dandy brush and remove the hair from the green felt. Sir. One or two of the brasses are not the best quality brass, okay? Sir. So you're just going to have to work on them a little bit to get them as clean as possible. Go on, Anson. Patrick Ride and Sterling, sir. OK, you can just see a little bit of sweat coming through under the boots still, so you need to apply more polish. Well, what's this? Me? Brass is digging out. Got this um, piece of webbing. Should have been cut off, released. It's all going horribly wrong for Trooper Lee Pettit. Come here. That's come from coming over from the stables this morning. That means the horse is dirty as well. Now, that's not good. That, that's the worst horse so far with the saddle. Get over, Sterling. And the captain knows exactly where to find fault. To Wakefield riding vagabond, sir. That polish again on the boots, yeah. No. Build up of the uh, grit and hair, okay. So also, you need more work on your brass. They may have got away with it so far, but there is still Trooper Glenn Forrest to go. If he fails they can kiss goodbye to the three-day pass. He's already come in for special attention, mainly through his inability to get on a horse. Come on, everyone's getting liver because of you. Get up, horse. Look at the blanket. It's a little bit low. Has he done enough to win everyone some leave? Do you know what the type of bit this is? Tea bit, sir. Tea snaffle, yeah? OK. Come on, Major. Right, guys. Uh, first, first time uh, in major inspection. When I say major, the first time I really had a good look at them. There's no problems with the tacking up, which is good. Obviously, now and again, you will get one of them and put something on wrong. OK, so otherwise, well done. Come on, straight on top! They've passed the inspection, but looking the part is not the same as riding the part. By now, they are supposed to be able to walk, trot and canter in unison. They've got to show they're good enough to earn the right to wear spurs. You your leg, Gail. Yeah. I think maybe a, a little the pressure of a, a good assessment now. They're thinking maybe, are we good enough? Are we not good enough? Can I move on to the next stage? But this is what we're trying to get out of it. What they're going to be like when they're standing in front of an officer or going on parade, state visit. Um, one or two will pass out just through the pressure. And um, this is why we're now introducing different sort of inspections at different times. And as we go through, the more of a standard we require. 
Number one section, right. Turn! Number two section, right. Turn! All right, we'll call go. I want to see his quickest and best dismount, OK? Right, quickest and best dismount! Straight off! And standing still, perfectly still, to attention. OK, we're well, listening to the uh, OC. What I've seen this morning, OK, turnout was good. One individual, OK, won't name that person. But uh, everyone was up to the required standard. So, on that, well done. You have earned your spurs. And also, you'll also be going on a 72-hour pass. Trooper Kiwi Hookham is the first to be awarded his spurs. I don't like using spurs, but, you know, got to go with what we're told. See how many do as you're told. Remember, you've earned the right now, OK? Sure. Go back to your horse. Remember, you need to keep control of the horse, then obviously put them on. You've got those little bear boys. I'm pretty stoked about that, actually. Morning, Forrest. Morning, sir. You well? Yes, sir. It's like, like a mini pass off in a fake up. So, yeah, it proves that I, well, I can do the job in a fashion. I come here with no riding experience and I can like, walk, trot, can and do everything on my own now. So, yeah, but yeah, it's cool, it's a good feeling. Extra kit to clean, but oh, well, it'd be worth it. But, yeah, it's good. It's dawn on the Canadian training ground and the household cavalry are awaiting the order to charge. 634 Tank Battalion Op Force mission is to attack. And the main body will advance rapidly from the line of departure over the Suffield and then hell to let it all the way up to the Fairhurst. The main effort is the seizing and holding of the crossings on the River Fairhurst. First, they send in an advance guard to seek out the enemy and probe their defences. It's all about speed and decisive manoeuvres. To stay alive, they need to cover the open ground as fast as possible. It's quite painful. You get thrown around a lot. So occasionally, your whole um, helmet and uh, ear set will be thrown off because you're literally being launched around so hard. And The ground here looks like a flat prairie, but actually, when you look close, there are hundreds and hundreds of little holes. And the suspension on these CVRT does not react well to them, and uh, it's hellish to go over at 50 kilometers an hour in a turret. David and the Household Cavalry's objective, the Fairhurst River, lies two miles dead ahead. But in the way are 20 heavyweight Challenger tanks of the battle group. Their task is to stop the cavalry. In this war game, the small Household Cavalry tanks have the virtual punching power of a T-72, the old Soviet main battle tank, but they are outnumbered four to one. David is taking on Goliath. Over in Mission Control, the whole exercise is being carefully controlled. The tracking screens show the cavalry's forward vehicles in red, advancing rapidly into battle. Uh, detected the recce battalion minus on the 79 Northing on the Bingville Road, concentrating... Every vehicle has an identification number. 8-0 is in the thick of the action. They're coming under heavy fire from much larger forces, so start to take evasive action. But 8-0 is trapped. He is forced into a minefield and destroyed by concentrated laser fire. The recorder shows it's a virtual kill, and 8-0 is out of the battle. Its destruction is recorded at Mission Control. I came over the brow here. I saw vehicles over there. Um, didn't see the uh, challengers over there. Caught game, saw them. I thought he was looking at the ones over to the northwest and uh, engaged us. Five kilometres behind this opening skirmish, the regiment's second in command discovers his first wave of tanks have been wiped out. What? He's lost his forward eyes and ears and is now struggling to communicate with his troops. Uh, do you want a sit rep? At the moment, we've made a very fast, rapid push to the west. Um, uh, the comms have got very bad, so we can't actually understand what anybody's doing out there at the moment. have got a rough idea that we're about two kilometres away from our objective uh, with the lead elements of our tank force. With the forward tanks destroyed, it's now left to the main force to punch their way through to the Fairhurst River in a classic cavalry charge. 
To support the second wave of household cavalry tanks, they call in virtual artillery in an effort to obliterate the enemy tanks. We're artillery, basically, and we're bringing down the missions. They do a lot of damage. Um, they've got um, ammunition in nature such as bomblets, um, proximity and HE, which is very heavy stuff, causes a lot of damage. Very frightening stuff. Uh, you should be aware we've got a fire plant now coming in to your north, uh, three Ks, and a target in the area of Gulf is being engaged on. Mission Control's computer shows blue lines of incoming artillery fire. With all the forces converging, battle intensifies. Tanks on both sides are being scrubbed out, destroyed. Steady, on, one time challenge and open. The second wave is now in the thick of a full-on tank battle. Engage. Three zero three two. Uh, one time challenge. Engage and destroy. Uh, engaging two more four sites, which are currently in southeast of our Jamie. Over. But gradually, David appears to be beating Goliath. The second wave is threatening to break through. So Games Master decides to throw everything at them. All those call signs are from the enemy that have crossed the Antwerp Road and are now uh, to the north are to be hunted down and destroyed. Both sides race for the river, the cavalry's objective. In their final roll of the dice, the battle group now try to kill the household cavalry's field commander. That's Colonel Charlie Clee in Scimitar 00 but he's not giving in without a fight. Right, kill up. Kill them. Sadly for Colonel Klee, war makes no distinction of rank. Overwhelmed by sheer weight of numbers, he dies a virtual death. Nearly all of the cavalry's vehicles have been destroyed. But three evaded the challengers and made it to the river, their objective. Despite his lack of battle experience, Lieutenant David Crosthwaite Air survived. We've completed half our mission that we've made a crossing. Um, we've been swamped by challenges all morning. Um, and in the second part of the mission, which was just to hold the crossing that we've made, um, we've only got two more call signs on it, um, 17 and 81, who are still out there. I hope they'll consider it a success for us because we made a crossing, which, which we're pleased with, but sadly we couldn't hold on for much longer. The challenges are too, too numerous. Mission completed, the squadrons regroup and return to camp. Despite the heavy losses, Colonel Klee is more than satisfied with the performance of his men. Our boys have been absolutely superb. Uh, they've worked extremely hard. In most of our missions, company commanders have been killed at various stages, and yet the plans have still succeeded uh, at every level, whether it's a troop corporal or, or, or a corporal of horse or a young troop leader. They've all stepped up and they've assumed command, and it's part of the trait of being a household cavalry. In London, the cavalry's role couldn't be more different. Crowds are starting to gather in the Mall for the official state visit of the Italian president. As a head of state, President Carlo Ciampi is getting the full works on his visit to Buckingham Palace. At Knightsbridge Barracks, preparations for the procession are well underway. For the trainee troopers, freshly returned from leave, this will be their first ceremonial duty, in full state uniform, but without their horses. The helmet and breastplate alone are worth £4,000. They've been polishing it for days. All the eyes of the world are on you. If the Queen goes anywhere, you go with her. You're not only representing the British Army, you're representing the country. And it's its own prestigious uh, element. Trooper Liam Wakefield is a huge fan of the ceremonial side of the job. I haven't missed Trooping the Colour on TV for last 11 years. And, uh, it's sad. Yeah, it's because yeah. I'm sad. Trooper Glenn Forrest is discovering that it all requires constant, meticulous upkeep. Just bobbing a jack boot. Uh, Liam's working on carasses and Adrian's working on uh, the uh, gauntlets, painted halves. When you're in the clean rooms doing it, you're like up to like silly o'clock in the morning doing you want it. to live, just go, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, you've just got no morale and you just think, oh, wait, it's knife, I'm going to slip my wrist. Would you rather go out for a fight? <laughs> On that, you've got, yeah. They are in charge of a sword for the very first time. Each sword's the same, every trooper gets the same sword. You see, I've got the same sword. Made by Wilkinson's. 
got your hill, your sword, your handle, your sword knot, and your what we call the skull crusher. Nice little ball on the end. If anybody comes to attack us, whack them on head. It's got a brilliant pain, brilliant pain. The standard issue cavalry sword dates back to 1892. For extra grip, the handle is made from shark skin. There is a specific drill for every sword action and maneuver. The little finger has to go behind. So it's, it's, it's more painful to carry like this, but when you do this, all these movements and that, it's quite easier because doing this with a full hand grip is it forces your wrist up, so that means your arms comes up and it's not level anymore, and it makes it look bad, so, so that's why they do it. But it's all fancy and stuff. For today's state visit, the troopers will be on foot duty, lining the staircase of Buckingham Palace. So for the last few days, they've been practicing marching. In boots, upstairs, and downstairs. For Trooper Wakefield, to guard the Queen at a state event is the culmination of a lifetime's ambition. After watching it for something like 11 years, you, you, you see all pomp and circumstance and everything, and then you're going to be part of it. This is something that I've wanted to do for absolutely years, and to be part of doing it now, it's spectacular. And I, I'm slightly nervous, but I'm not as nervous as I expected to be, because we've done all training and everything, we've trained to do it, so well, we shouldn't have a problem, really. Yeah, yeah, we know. Yeah, no. Commanding the staircase lining party is Squadron Corporal Major Graham Gardner. For these guys here, is their first ever ceremonial parade, the first time in their career in front of the Queen. So it's a massive, massive responsibility for them and a great honour. Right, call in, lifeguards, descend, blues and rolls. The other end. Before the parade, everyone has to adopt the jackboot waddle. This is to keep their polish pristine and avoid any cracking around the ankles. Glenn Forrest will not be on parade. He's drawn the short straw and is operating as pit crew. So you're just going along making sure that all the thumbprints are off and that the uh, tunics are brushed down. Just uh, cleaning up all the loose bits, bobs and ends. It's hard, but it's rewarding. Yeah. Especially when you see all there. the guys out there and they're all lined up and stuff. I think it's going to be us soon. They got some white in your boot there, mate. You know what Don't. Do? <laughs> the Household Cavalry Stair Party is going to comprise three members of the Lifeguards and three of the Blues and Royals. In keeping with tradition, the Blues and Royals wear their chin straps under their chins. The Lifeguards do not. There's a few butterflies there floating around everywhere. So it's a big day for him. You know, so it's, it's their first sort of a parade in front of any sort of royalty or anything like that. But they've done plenty of practice, the kit's there, so hopefully everything will go well. If it doesn't, then my head's on the chopping block tomorrow morning, eh? <laughs> right, guys, what we want to do now is just slowly and carefully just uh, get onto the minibus. Don't trash your kit. Once the new boys have marched past the old boys, who are doing the mounted part of the ceremony, they remove their boots and clamber aboard their luxury coach for the short trip to Buckingham Palace. Oh, oh, oh that is awesome. Oh, no, I can't see it, I can't see it. Blues and Royals, lifeguards lined up either side, making way for the great white transit van. <laughs> At Buckingham Palace, the crowds are already waiting for the Queen and President Ciampi of Italy to arrive. Enjoy that. That was fantastic. The Irish guards are forming up in the inner quadrangle. And the Queen's Cavalry's newest recruits have taken up position, on guard at the front door. Outside, the Blues and Royals lead the royal procession up the Mall and into the palace. For Trooper Wakefield and the boys, this is their first brush with royalty. 
In keeping with their role as the monarch's trusted bodyguard, they are the only soldiers in the British Army allowed to draw their swords in Her Majesty's presence. For these 18 and 19 year olds, it's an unforgettable experience. It feels as though you're watching it on TV. It was quite weird. You look like that. Ooh, no. Ooh, no. Ooh, no. Trooper Metcalf lost all circulation to his extremities. I couldn't feel my hands after about 10 minutes. I couldn't feel my scabbard, I couldn't feel my sword. Could have gone better. Put it that way. Standing still for half an hour proved hard work. And the parade ends with the dreaded march upstairs. Coming back into the palace, there's some people falling downstairs. Ben fell back, and uh, I went backwards as well when we were walking up the stairs. Apart from that, everything went fine. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. And breathe again. Breathe there, Art. Let's go. Next time on the Queen's Cavalry. There are testing times for the new tank drivers. Over there. Do that on your test. Failed. Right, we failed that. And chaos in the countryside when Vagabond takes Trooper Wakefield for an unscheduled swim. Oh, who's that? Oh, God, bloody hell. I knew something was going to happen today. <laughs>